Well, hey, how are you? It's good. It's great to be with you. Uh, and uh, we actually have all of our campuses joining us this weekend, so just welcoming all of you. Uh, one of the cool things over the summer was to be able to visit, uh, over the course of the summer, almost all of our services and to see what's happening. Uh, the Saturday Night Gang uh, over at Central Abbey, they carried on with their meals each week, uh, although we didn't here at Downs Road, but it was cool to be with them. Uh, North Shore, uh, one service at Mission, and a, a packed house in one service. That was really cool. East Abbey. The only place I didn't get to was for those of you in Fleetwood and Real Life Church, but uh, because Ezra was there most weekends this summer, you were already burdened enough. So I didn't want to burden you by showing up myself. But anyway, greetings to all of you. We are going to finish off uh, the last four months of this study in the book of 1 Peter. You're probably going to want to have your Bibles open because we're going to flip through it. Uh, what I hope to do tonight is actually re-preach all 17 messages uh, in the next 40 minutes. So that's what we're going to be up to. Uh, it is an important and a timely book for us to be studying. Uh, it is a letter of challenge and encouragement written to this tiny group in the beginning of Christianity and the uh, pre-Christian world of what we call today Turkey, Asia Minor, first century pre-Christians in the, in the Roman world under Emperor Nero. And if you were to summarize this book down to one sentence, it might put it in a question this way, how do we live Christianly in a world that may or may not affirm our beliefs? That, that would really be a great summary of this book written to that first century and also written to us in the 21st century. How do we live Christianly in a world that may or may not affirm our beliefs? And so as we come to the close of this book, Peter gives one final shot of encouragement to stand firm in what we have learned to know about who God is. So last week, we are picking up the paragraph from last week, humble yourself into the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you, look out for Satan, the enemy, he's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking somebody to devour, and then that paragraph carries on and finishes with this in verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, so the church in Rome, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love, which Pastor Freddie has taken seriously, if you've met him. And peace to all of you who are in Christ. So that's the text that we're in. And what Peter is pointing to is the reserves that we have in Christ, the reserves we need. And it is really the bookend to this book. If you take the bookend on the front half in chapter 1 and now uh, another bookend on the end, there's a, a bit of a mirror happening here. The race that started with the call of God on their lives, the call of God's grace in chapter 1, is now summarized. This is the true grace of God that he is going to strengthen you with. And even though you're living under Emperor Nero, even though you're not in a Western democracy with freedom of religion, you're living under the, the thumb of a dictator, you can still serve him. And even though the heat is rising, Jesus Christ is going to have dominion. And then the beginning reminded us of our living hope, our guaranteed inheritance, our secure salvation that we're born again into. And then he closes by saying, and this is the true grace of God that I've declared to you just briefly in these four or five short chapters. So now stand firm in it. So where we're headed is we're going to take a look at that final encouragement, those first few uh, the verses we read. Then we're going to review where we have been over the, the summer months. And then what I'd like to do is end with a few points of application that I think we can take with us. And the reason I want to do this review is because we spent four long months in this book. Uh, we will likely not come back to 1 Peter probably for several years. So as you think back on 1 Peter to get a few handles in your mind, what is that book about and what were the major themes? And so I'm going to recover what we did. But as he, Peter closes it, he says, after you've suffered for a while, God is going to restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He, he piles four words up on top of one another. And some commentators say, like, well, don't worry about the individual words because they're just synonyms. It's just rhetorical flourish. It's what speakers do. It's what writers do. They just pile synonyms, bang, 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 one on top of another. But interestingly, when you look at these individual words, they each have a unique emphasis, and I think it's worth taking note of. 
He says that God himself, now note that it is God who's going to do this work. God himself will restore us. He says, I will restore. Uh, That word typically means that I will supply or equip. uh, The common usage, one of the common usages, was the mending of fishing nets, which I think is pretty interesting when you think who's writing this. It was Peter. And if you remember Peter's call, he and his brother were fishing when Jesus called him and they left their fishing nets behind to follow him. And then Peter later in his life, if you remember the end of the story of Jesus' resurrection, after Peter has denied Christ, the night night that he was betrayed, three times, and Jesus had said to him, you know what, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But when you return to me and when you're restored, you're actually going to be used to strengthen your brother. And that restoration happens again when Peter is fishing. Post-resurrection, John 21, Jesus comes to Peter and his his gang as they're out fishing. And he he builds a fire on the beach and they recognize that it's Jesus. And they come in and, and Peter is restored. He is mended. The restoring work of God in our lives. One of the uh, most beautiful promises in the Old Testament is in the book of Joel, where after a time of God's judgment and the people of God, he gets this promise, this invitation. The Lord says to them, yet even now, return to me with all your heart. Even though you're in this dark cultural moment and where the judgment of God has been poured out, return to God, return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful. And then here is this amazing promise, and I'll restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Like many of you could tell stories of the years that were lost because of decisions that you made, walking away from the Lord or whatever it may be, and then on your return to the Lord, how the Lord in his favor and in his grace actually restored those years that were wasted. Amen? I will restore. I will confirm, he says. Uh, Interesting, most often used to talk about healing in our bodies. The fact that uh, the frailties and the infirmities of life, the disabilities and the sicknesses that we all inevitably deal with as we make our journey through life. That's, that's most typical in the medical world. So common. Your, your body needs a bit of a boost in its healing. And so the sicknesses that we face in this life, in the spiritual sense, I will confirm, refers us that God makes up for our weaknesses with his strength. He makes up for our frailties with his strength. Uh, I know you're suffering. I have suffered with you. My my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, One of the most famous texts is Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh. And the Lord is saying to him, don't worry about it. My power is made perfect in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you even in this trial. The third phrase, I will strengthen you. This one's particularly interesting because of the Greek word, is the English word steroid. That's interesting, is it not? In other words, I'm going to inject some strength into your life. It's a medical world. Uh, So common. The body needs a little bit of help in healing. There's some injury that you've experienced. There's inflammation. Uh, There's aching joints. There's arthritis. Maybe you have a torn meniscus, whatever it might be. And the doctor says a shot of cortisone is going to do you wonders. Insert some steroids in. More infamous, of course, in the athletic world are those athletes who take performance-enhancing drugs. Steroids, right? Uh, We've seen way too many stories and heard one too many of athletes who have accomplished some great feat and then only later. I think back to Ben Johnson who lost his, his Olympic medals because he failed a drug test. One of the guys that so disappointed me was Lance Armstrong. Cyclist who worldwide fame, he won seven Tour de France's. What made it amazing was not that he won seven, which was an accomplishment, but in the middle of those, he had a battle with cancer and he was out of cycling for two or three years as he fought cancer. And then he had a clean bill of health and he trained again and he went back and he raced again and he won seven Tour de France. Woo, you're the man. Until we found out that it was propped up with artificial steroids, right? To take it in the positive... I love how Eugene Peterson adapts this concept in in Hebrews 12 when he paraphrases it in the message. So Hebrews 12 is, of course, on the heels of Hebrews 11, all the great men and women of faith who've gone before us, the hall of faith, Hebrews 11. And then it says, but not just those, thinking of them, the cloud of witnesses, but also get your eyes on Jesus. 
So sure, all the saints that have gone before us, that's great, but fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Get your eyes on Jesus. And I like how Peterson paraphrases it, the next verse when he says this. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story, the Jesus story, again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, and then here's our key phrase, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Get your eyes on Jesus. He will restore, confirm, strengthen, and then finally, he says, he'll establish you. Different word. And it's the word for firm foundation. So most of you know that Carolyn and I lived eight years in Vancouver, just up the hill from Granville Island. One of the favorite things we did was just simply to walk the city, like miles and miles and miles walking the city. And I really enjoyed standing at the edge of those skyscraper holes and looking down as they dug down and down and down and down, it seemed, into the ground. And then it took months to get with concrete and steel up to ground level again. And one builder explained to me that in the building of a skyscraper, you can divide it into three pretty well equal parts. One third of the time is spent underground. Another third will take that tower right up to the sky, 30, 40 feet high. And then another third of the time is to backfill it and finish out the, uh, the interiors of it. And as you're watching that foundation go down, 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 you're like, it only makes sense because the taller that building is, the firmer the foundation needs to be. And it's the same concept that Jesus had in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 when he said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Firm foundation. Build your life on this. So, after you've suffered for a while, the Lord himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He will knit you together. He'll pour strength into your frail life. He'll shoot adrenaline into your soul. And he will give you a sure foundation. Notice very carefully what it says. He will do it. The Lord is the one who does this. And then I love verse 11 because he sort of just matter-of-factly adds this. And by the way, Jesus will have dominion. Make no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like Nero's on the throne right now, but don't worry about it. Because unto Jesus be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he wraps it up there in verse 12 saying, So so I've written to you briefly about the grace of God, so now stand firm in it. So Peter is tying a bow on this study. So we are going to remind ourselves of where we've been. We have talked a lot in the last four months. We started this the first weekend in May. We have taught a lot about the cultural moment that we find ourselves in, that for most of us in this room and those of you listening, lived in a culture that has not only affirmed our Christian beliefs, but has also upheld and supported our beliefs in the public square. That at least here in Canada and the U.S., we understand that our nations were built on Judeo-Christian values. And so we've come back to this question time and time and time again. What kind of Christians will we be as the culture wars heat up around us? Because it was easier to live the Christian life when the culture at large affirmed the Christian worldview. When the culture affirms the narrative of Scripture that there was indeed a creator and that we are actually accountable to that creator. And when the culture at large affirms that, it's easier to then to live out our Christian life. So I mentioned to you at the beginning of the study that 1 Peter has been somewhat a neglected book in recent years. And not because it's irrelevant and certainly not because it's not inspired, but because some people see it as irrelevant to the days that we live in. That for Christians living in the freedom of the Western democratic worlds that we live in, not living under persecution, I mean, certainly you look at the money south of the border, it says, on the money in God we trust. In Canada, our national anthem is, oh God, keep our land glorious and free. So if for whatever reason, the Lord moved you and dropped you halfway around the world somewhere, and you set up life in some atheistic state. Uh, The Lord dropped you in communist China or North Korea or any other totalitarian state. 
If the Lord did that, you would not expect the affirmation of the culture around you. You would know better. You would know you were an alien and a stranger. And the shock for some of us in North America is that it feels like I went to bed one evening, and when I woke up in the morning, somebody changed all the rules. Somebody stole the country that I thought I knew. Or as the title of one of the books I read in this series, Evangelism as Exiles, the subtitle of this book, Life on Mission, and then here's the key phrase, as strangers in your own land. See, it's one thing to be strangers overseas, but when you feel like a stranger here at home, it's different. And so we have talked a lot about our cultural moment. And this slide, one of the best, you've seen it like half a dozen times, I think illustrates it best, uh, Ed Stetzer's Cultural River. We've seen it a lot, but it's a great illustration that there was a time 40 to 60 years ago on the left-hand side of that screen when Christianity was in the majority, it was in the mainstream, but that there has always been a cultural divide in North America. You were always free in North America to not be a Christian, to embrace some other theological frame of reference, to embrace Buddhist theology or Islamic theology or Mormonism or Jehovah Witnessism or atheism or just nothing at all, that there was always people who claimed something other than Christianity, but they were somehow on the other side of this cultural divide. And the majority stream was made up of these three groups, convictional Christians... The core Christian beliefs were held to be true, actively engaged in, an, in a local church, worshiping, serving, and loving those convictional Christians living out their faith. And then congregational Christians, a whole group of people who maybe not were active in their church, but they would identify, sure, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Methodist, I'm Mennonite, I'm Baptist, I'm something. I'm a member of my church, in fact, and I, and I go there when it's convenient, uh, certainly, I go there at the important seasons of the year. I am there every Christmas and Easter, guaranteed. Maybe Mother's Day, maybe Thanksgiving. And we're there for the important events in our life. When babies are born, when we have a wedding, or if we need a funeral, then we go to the church. The church is there for hatching and matching and dispatching. We like our church. And then cultural Christians were those who were not attached to any particular church or denomination, but they lived in this cultural stream. And they would give a nod even to the Ten Commandments. Doesn't sound like bad ideas. Seems okay to me. And the Christians in my neighborhood, they're nice people. They do some good stuff. I'm okay with it. And what religious sociologists call those two groups in the middle is sort of this great deep theological term, the squishy middle. Nominal Christianity. And how it is rapidly disappearing. And that being said... Carl Truman reminded us of this, that every age has had its darkness and dangers. Every age, not just ours. And the task of the Christian, and I like this quote, that's why I've given it to you two or three times. The task of the Christian is not to whine. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that. Your task is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand its problems and to respond appropriately. That's our calling. Or as Karen Jobes in her commentary says, wherever Christians are a minority, the message of 1 Peter takes on renewed relevance. You go anywhere around the world where Christians are the minority, this book will have new relevance. 1 Peter presents the Christian community as a colony in a strange land, an island of one culture in the midst of another. And so Peter writes to this first century audience, and it is incredibly relevant to us today, don't freak out, don't be surprised. In fact, you need to embrace your identity as aliens and strangers and sojourners and exiles. That's what the book was all about. Okay, we're only 20 minutes in, I'm not done yet. The overall theme, of course, is standing firm when the heat is getting turned up. The theme of suffering for the cause of Christ. But underneath that macro theme, we looked at three particular truths, that our identity matters, and that our calling matters, and that our attitude matters. And I'm just going to remind you of them. So if you missed all summer, you're getting the whole summer in one message. Good for you. Number one, we spent six weeks 
going through the first chapter and a half, talking about our identity in Christ. The identity given to us by the Father when he called us to himself. And in those early weeks, we looked at these words, that we are called to be a rejoicing people, a holy people, a loving people, a representative people, and an alien people. And you might remember some of that. That if nothing else sets us apart, number one, if nothing else sets us apart from the world around us, it should be that the sound of praise is always on our lips. That we are known as a rejoicing people. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ because he has saved us into this living hope, this guaranteed inheritance, and this secure salvation, and therefore we rejoice in the Lord. And it is not a sugar-coated, stick your head in the sand, try to ignore the trials, rose-colored glasses. It's none of that because there were three even those. And he said it right away, even though right now you have some trials in your life, you should still be rejoicing. Not in the trials, you rejoice in your living hope. Amen? Amen. And it's why I like the artwork, although it's been a little bit bright. I like it. When we talked about it, so Dakota and Adam, we were talking about First Peter. What should the artwork behind it look like? And it could be very dark and foreboding. In fact, we talked about that. Oh, culture's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, let's put up a, a tornado or a cyclone or some dark storm clouds and lightning bolts. Let's make it all dark colors. Or we could grab the metaphor in chapter one that, you know what? Tomorrow morning, the sun is going to come up over Mount Baker. And Jesus is still on the throne. And as we do life in the Fraser Valley and as we live out our lives, we do so with an optimism that we live out of a living hope. And as, as much as dark storm clouds come our way, that is not our focus. Our focus is on the living hope and the bright future that we have. We are called to be a holy people. Not a holier than thou, and certainly not a prudish puritanism that says you can never laugh and you can never have fun as Christians, but this sense of otherness, this set-apartness that God is so completely other. And it goes to this sense of awe at the high price of our salvation. So if you look at chapter 1, verse 15, that's where this whole chunk began. As he who called you is holy, be holy in your conduct. And then verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways, from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with precious blood, the blood of Christ. That the high price that was paid, who would love us in such a way? If you have ever received an amazing gift, you will know the sense of awe that you live with. On an incredibly much lesser scale, years ago, maybe 20 odd years ago, Carolyn and I, back in the day, you remember the show Extreme Home Makeovers? You remember those? Carolyn and I were actually the recipients of one of these. And the long story short is we lived in this 60-year-old house, and we year by year were working on projects in this room and that room and bathrooms and countertops and blah, blah, blah. And then we had a flood in our basement. And we got a little insurance money, and we're like, we're done with it. Let's just hire a contractor, get it done right. Whatever the insurance doesn't pay, we'll put it onto the mortgage. A guy from the church came over, looked at the basement, said, I'll come back. A week later, he comes back, and he's got a set of plans and he rolls them out and he says, look, here's what we want to do in your basement. This room needs to be moved there. The washroom needs to go there. As he's talking, I'm going ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. And he goes, and as out your house, I notice that the roof is sagging. We need to rebuild your trusses and, and, and. And I'm going, oh my goodness. And then he goes, and by the way, I just came from a breakfast meeting with about 20 other guys in the church and each one of them put a little money in the pot and they want to pay for it. And Carolyn and I were in tears and long story short, we left for two weeks of vacation, and I guess every trade in Kelowna de descended on our home. And by the time we got back, that basement had been completely redone. And I will tell you this, that every time I walked down into that basement from then on out, I had a sense of wonder and awe at the great love that these people had toward us. And it was only dollars and cents. That people would love us so much to actually give us a gift. And it's like, if God loved us so much that he purchased our lives, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of his son, should we not then stand in incredible awe? A holy people. A loving people. It needs no explanation. They'll know we're Christians by our love. A representative people. We talked about the priesthood. 
And we know what priests do. They, they, they bring God to people and they bring people to God. And yes, Jesus is the high priest, but we are told here that we, as God's people, act as a priest to our, our nation, that we act as ambassadors. We plead with people, be reconciled to, to Christ. And then finally, that we are called as an alien people and that we are to embrace this experience as exiles and strangers, that we embrace this identity and that we get comfortable with a sense of ambiguity and strangeness. In other words, you never expect to feel completely at home here because it's not your home. And that our number one goal should not be somehow to fit in or to blend in, or to be hip and cool and with it, because to be accommodated to a dying culture is to be a dying person, right? So our identity matters. And secondly, we talked about our calling mattering. Peter talked about it in four different ways. Uh, The overarching theme, obviously, our call to salvation. And, And this comes up several times in the book. The book opens talking about our salvation uh, as elect exiles, Uh, Chapter 1, verse 15, talks about he who has called you. Chapter 2, verse 9, he's called you out of darkness. Chapter 5, which we read, verse 10, he's called you to eternal glory. All of those callings refer to the call to salvation. So that's the overarching calling. But within that call to salvation, he specifically says you're not only called to salvation, you're called unto some other stuff. You're called to speak, you're called to follow, you're called to bless. Chapter 2, verse 9, the one who called you so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him. Chapter 2, verse 21, as Christ has suffered, you are called to this, to follow in his steps, to embrace the family identity. And then chapter 3, verse 9, when you're reviled, when people are hurling insults at you, instead of reviling them back, you are, it literally says, you are called to bless. They can heckle you all they want, but you don't heckle back. You bless them. In, in turn. So we want to know what our mission is. We want to know what our calling is. Well, of course, we have the entire New Testament. But if we limit it just to First Peter, we would say, well, at least we know that our calling is to speak and to suffer well and to bless the people around us. And then that leads us finally to the attitude and that our attitude matters. And this is where this book got intensely practical. How should we live out our lives? So we are supposed to be rejoicing, holy, lovey, representative, alien people. But how do we live it out? With this countercultural attitude of humility and submission. And he illustrated it in three specific ways. How do we respond to governing authority? And that is a provocative text Not just given the time that we live in, but it was provocative in the first century because Nero was on the throne. Remind yourself, this was not written to a free Western democracy. This was written to people who were under the thumb of the so-called Pax Romana, which means you have peace as long as you don't in any way push back. And, And Peter said to them, you know what? Honor the emperor. Honor Nero? Yes, honor the emperor. How do we interact in our work lives? Masters and slaves, or the comparison is, in our day, employers and employees. And then finally, in our families, and in particular, he illustrates it this, what would a believing wife do if her husband was not a believer? How should she live in that household? And so we talked a lot about our identity and our calling and our attitude. But beyond all of these is this theme... It is an overarching call of the New Testament to go into the world and make disciples. And then this text would push us to say, well, how do we make disciples as exiles and strangers? Or if you put it into our modern language, we might ask the question this way or state it this way, that we are called to live on mission while in exile. It's still our call. We are called to live on mission while we are in exile. So at the end of four months... The question might be, then, how should we live? And I hope that this study has encouraged you. I hope that it has given you a rock-solid security in who you are in Christ and where he is leading us. And yes, it is absolutely true that the mainstream of our culture is moving away from our Judeo-Christian heritage. That is absolutely true. We are not in Kansas anymore. Get the reference? Houston, we have a problem. 
The question is, will we see ourselves as a shrinking minority? Will we take on a victim mentality? Or will we see ourselves as people sent on mission into a broken, needy world with the words of life? So Northview, I need to encourage you that God has given us so much. And that frankly, our time and place is a little bit of an anomaly even in Canada. This place we call home, those of you in Fleetwood, those of you in Mission, those of you in Abbotsford, many driving from Chilliwack, Maple Ridge, the Fraser Valley. The Fraser Valley is a little bit of an anomaly in Canadian culture. There is still a Christian memory here that is not strong in other parts of the country. And so the question is, in this moment of time that we live in as a church family and as individuals, will we leverage what God has given us in this moment for greater kingdom advance? Will we take advantage of our situation? Will we not shrink back? But instead, will we actually pour more time and more effort and more prayer and more resources into making more and better disciples and more and better leaders and hopefully planting and replanting more and better churches? Will we take advantage of the moment that we have right now? And the question, of course, is can we stem the tide of culture? Well, only God knows that. Historically, however, we know there have been times where God has turned it 180 degrees around. And he might. But what we do know is that if we're not dead, then he's not done with us yet. Right? Uh, Check your pulse just for a second. (laughs) If you're not dead, he's not done with you. We also know, according to this text, that Jesus will have dominion. And that should be a huge amen. Amen. So I read a couple biographies uh, over the summer, and one of them was James Houston's autobiography, and I, I, I got to throw his picture up here because the guy just encourages me simply to read about his life. He's 99 years old. If he makes it to November, he'll turn 100. He identifies himself as a joyful exile. Now, he actually wrote a book a few years ago by that title. That's not his autobiography, but a book by the title. But he calls himself an exile, but a joyful exile. That we live here for this time and place, as long as God gives us health and strength, and as long as up to 99 years, I am going to live as a joyful exile. Or as Stephen Paw said in his book, we can fully understand ourselves as being strangers in a post-Christian culture and yet not be depressed about it. We are not left here to simply endure. We are meant to thrive, brothers and sisters. And we are meant to have an impact, and we are meant to live on mission. So I want to wrap it up with five very practical pointers. If we were to ask the question, as exiles and strangers, how can we have a practical impact? And if I put it this way, how can we open up someone to the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can we have an impact in the life of the people around us and usher them toward the Lord in one way, shape, and form? And so I want to give you five practical takeaways, and then we'll wrap it up. So number one, let me tell you this, it's impossible. Does that encourage you? I had to start there because we need to start there to know that only God can do this. It is only God that will move a person toward himself. Jesus said it himself. Nobody comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When you're dead in your sins, what do dead people do? Nothing. God makes you alive. So there is a work that only the Spirit of God can do in changing a cold heart into a warm heart, a hard heart into a soft heart, taking a dead person, making them alive, a blind person, and and making them see. And so what does it motivate us to do? It motivates us to pray like crazy. Because you're like, Lord, we can't do this. But you can. And so, Lord, would you move in the lives of people that we know and love who are far from you, and would you do what only you can do? And if we did nothing more than simply pray, what might happen? I think I told you this story before, but we were in North India a number of years ago. Try to make it short. Medical doctors and church planters. When we were there, the church, about 200 strong, was packed out. They were hanging from the rafters. We had lunch with them, and they said it wasn't always like this. For the first 20 years of our ministry, somebody had come to faith and then somebody had persecute them. They'd fall away. 
A few would come to faith, they'd get persecuted, fall away. We were ready to give up. And then at about the 20 year mark, this team from YWAM showed up in our village for an entire year and they did nothing in our village, but they lived up in that house on the hillside overlooking the village and they prayed over our village. They played soccer with the kids. They did not evangelize. They didn't mention the gospel. They simply were there and they were prayerful for 12 full months and then they left. And the next year, it was as though heaven had opened over our village. And by the tens and then by the twenties and ultimately by the hundreds, people started to come into faith in Jesus. Lord, what would the Lord do if we would begin to pray like that over the Fraser Valley? Number two, build relationships and stay in proximity. Uh, uh, the assumption all the way through 1 Peter is that you're going to live good lives among the Gentiles, chapter 2, verse 12. And the, so the simple question is this, how many friendships do you have with people who are far from God? Just a simple question. How many friendships do you have with people who are far from God? Because most of you listening to this message do not need any more Christian friends. You need some non-Christian friends. How are you cultivating and investing in their lives and not investing in the gospel and sharing your faith, but simply investing in their life as a friend in proximity? Number three, yes, indeed, we do have to live differently. And I've mentioned this many, many times. Christians do everything the world does, do we not? We do education, we pay mortgages, our cars break down, we raise kids, we have sex, we pay our bills, we make little money or lots of money. We do everything the world does, do we not? But we do it differently. We do it according to the principles of this book that are our roadmap for thriving. And so we live different lives. And so the world should be able to look at us and say, you know what? What's different about you? Uh, this week we had a an evangelism training event with Bill Hogg and Andy Steiger. And, and one of the lines that stood out to me in that evening was this, live your life in such a way that it demands a gospel explanation. Number four, listen for evidence. This one came to me years ago reading Henry Blackaby. It really, really helped me. He said, you know what? If it's true, if the scripture's true, and that's an absolute full stop, yes, it's true, Romans 3 says, there's none righteous, no, not one, and no one seeks for God. No one looks for him. That's a resounding text. Amazing. No one looks for God? Well, the scripture says so. So Blackaby says this, if somebody is asking you a spiritual question of any type, shape, or form, it is a sign to you that the spirit of God has started a work in their life. Because they would not ask you a single spiritual question because no one seeks for God on their own. And the only way that they're even asking that beginning spiritual question is because obviously the spirits begin to nudge them. Now, does it mean you dump the entire evangelical truckload in the next conversation? Maybe not. They might be 10 years from coming to faith in Christ. There may be many steps along the journey, many links in the chain, but it is a sign to you that the Spirit of God is at work. And then finally, ultimately, the gospel does need to be spoken. And we should be ready when the opportunity comes. And in 1 Peter 3, he says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you with gentleness and respect. And so the question is, do we know a basic gospel presentation? And, and we have said this to you many, many times. If you can memorize just four little words, you can remember enough to trigger in your mind the entire gospel story. If you can just remember creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. All you need to do is just those four words. If you can remember those four words, they will trigger the rest of the story in your mind. Creation. Tell me about the creator. Tell me about how this all came about. We are not a cosmic accident. That is what we believe. Fall. We rebelled against the Lord. Tell them that story. Redemption. Jesus came to do for ourselves what we could not do, right? Amen. And restoration. We look forward to the living hope, a new heavens and a new earth. Do you have a simple gospel presentation in your mind that you can share when they ask? So, 1 Peter wrap-up. Ours is not to whine about the times that we've been given, but to be faithful in them. And he ends with one last shot of encouragement. After you have suffered for a while, he, he, King Jesus, will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And Jesus will have dominion. 
And at the end of the day, the only source of strength that is going to get us through is the grace of God that saved us. And then also he talks about the grace of God that will sustain us. And so, brothers and sisters, the question that I would leave with you at the end of four months in this short little book of the New Testament is this question, will you? Will you, in 2022... In Western Canada, in a 21st century post-Christian environment, will you stand firm? Will you stand firm for the cause of Christ? And the only way you're going to stand firm is if you lean on him, he, he will restore, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. So why don't you stand with me, all of our campuses, stand with me. I want to pray for you, and then the teams will come and lead us in response. Lord, it's been a good summer. Four long months in this short little book that is seemingly so relevant to us today. As we tried to get in the mind of those first century believers in the pre-Christian world, when they were up against the the challenges of the Roman Empire and uh, an emperor who demanded that he be worshipped as sovereign, And they tried to live Christianly in that first century. And then we think about the day that we live in, and oh God, we cry for your spirit to move across our nation. We don't want to have romantic rose-colored glasses looking back at the glory days when Canada was this wonderful place. Maybe it never was. But oh God, we long for a day when the spirit of God is poured out in new and fresh ways. We long for a day, Lord, when you are going to be opening people's hearts, when you will soften hard hearts, when you will warm up cold hearts, when you'll pull back the veil the enemy has and that they will see. And Lord, we know that you've put some of that responsibility on us, that you have called us a royal priesthood, that we bring people to God and God to people. You've called us ambassadors, that we plead with people, be reconciled to Christ. So Lord, would you strengthen us when we're frustrated, when we're discouraged, when we feel beat down? When we got the trials of life, as Peter says, when you have suffered for a little while, oh God, then we need you. We need you to restore us, to confirm us, to strengthen us, and to establish us. Bottom line, Lord, we need you to hold us fast. So God, would you do that good work? Would you hold us fast? We ask in Jesus' name, amen.